All right, once again, we are doing some practice from the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. And last time we did the iris flower, and this time we're gonna do a crashing wave in watercolor. Look how three-dimensional that wave looks. It looks amazing. We are going to be practicing this together in our nature journals. Um, get ready because it's going to be fun and exciting. Here is the iris from last time. Um, it came out okay. It was good practice as usual. This whole page on the other side was practice as well. So we are going to do this one. And this was the popular choice. This was voted for by all of you. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to my document camera. And I also just want to point out, this is the first time that I'm going live on LinkedIn. So this video right now is being broadcast live to Facebook, uh, my YouTube channel and my LinkedIn profile. So that is exciting because that's a new thing. I've been sharing videos on there before, but trying to get some more nature journaling content on LinkedIn um, is one of my goals. So this video is going live on there. If any of you are watching this on LinkedIn, please post something in the comments to let me know. So today there's a couple things we're going to need. You're going to need your watercolor. Uh, it doesn't need to be the same watercolor kit that I'm using. Any watercolor kit will do. Um, you also, it's going to be important to have some type of, um, I actually don't have a white crayon but either a white crayon or a white colored pencil. I have two that I'm gonna experiment with. Um, a white pastel might work, so anything like that. If you absolutely don't have that, it should be fine. Um, we'll find out soon. And then, of course, you need your watercolor brush. Um, some chocolate would be good to have. Um, I've got this 85% raspberry blackout, so... Um, and that's it that's all we need something to wipe your watercolor off on maybe like a extra sh sheet of paper or something like that um, and that's all we're gonna need i'm gonna look over here at the comments and say hi to people um Ivea's here hi Ivea. debbie marilyn's here angie's here um i'm so glad you can join in angie i'm so sorry about your brother um and i'm glad that you are back um to spend some time here. So let's get ready to jump right in. What I'm going to recommend for this exercise, and if you are following along in your books, um, this is page 288 and 289. Um, if you're following along in your own copy of um, Jack's book. So um, what I'm going to recommend is that we um, use pretty small, use a pretty small um, kind of area for these because I think this is going to be for a lot of us this is going to be a challenging technique so I'm going to create some little boxes to help me help remind myself that I'm focusing on experimentation mostly and testing out some of these um, these techniques that we're going to be doing here so one way that you might do that is by actually drawing out those boxes so for example I think that if you, you're you doing this exercise here, it's kind of hard to tell how big he actually made his, but I would recommend making it about this big. And if you're like me, having several of these will take the pressure off of each one. And it also means you can experiment with kind of different approaches on each one. So one thing I want to point out is that on the previous page, oh, Eli and Kate are here. Yay. One thing I want to point out is on this previous page, he talks about some of the perspective tricks that can apply to nature journaling. And I really want to point out this, um, this technique that he used. If you are actually, I don't think this is so useful for us um, doing this at home in the studio, but if you are going to the ocean, I do highly recommend this technique where you do sort of this color swatch almost like this and you practice just looking at the different colors and really focusing on what colors you actually see in the water and practicing depicting those. Um, so that is something I have, I have tried that before because the ocean can be really challenging and this is a way to sort of simplify it. And just, you can even do, you know, like 10 of these. 
Um, I also want to point out this thing right here where he shows you how to kind of depict some of the perspective in the wave um, and how these patterns of foam will change. So I did a, I, I did a couple tests of this. This might be a way that you can kind of break in your paper um, is by doing um, an experiment with this, what he's saying about this these lines. So what he's saying is, if you're looking out at the ocean, say that's the horizon right there, um, and there is like a wave coming towards you, um, there are going to be lines in the middle that are straight up and down. But as you look further down the beach, they will be more curved and those will get straighter and straighter. So this is say a cresting wave that hasn't broken yet. Um, hopefully that makes sense. That will apply somewhat to our drawing. Okay. So, um, right here, he talks about how I'm not going to read the whole introduction here, but he says that, um, Waves change every moment. Crashing surf is confusing to follow. He recommends uh, to capture one moment of wave motion. I will stare at a wave break, close my eyes to clear my brain, open them suddenly, and then close them again. So he's basically trying to take a snapshot um, and work from that. So luckily, we don't have to do that right now. We're going to work from his step by step. So the first thing, and this is going to be going sort of in this reverse order here, I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, the first thing we're going to be doing is creating sort of like reserving the whites around this mass of foam. So look at that mass of foam. And what we're going to do is with a pale purple color, we're going to draw, we're going to paint around that mass of foam. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, and of course you can see his, the, what we're going for sort of, um, shape wise there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of this purple that's already in my purple mixing area and put it into my, um, gray and black mixing area and get it sort of toned down and a little bit, um, less purple, less saturated purple. Then I'm going to dilute it quite a bit and test it. Um, I might as well just test it up here. That looks light enough to me. Um, I'm gonna remember what my overall sort of shape is here. I might actually sort of draw in the shape of the wave um, here. You might not be able to see this. If you have the book, you can follow along from your book. You might not be able to see this particular part on mine because it's gonna be quite faint. And so then just draw in these um, the shadows that you see in the foam. So you can kind of see that on mine. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to work on several at the same time. And I might just do some swatches of this over here. Color swatches just to get some of my colors down in case I want to do any experiments with them later. Okay, now in the book, you can't even see the next step. It looks the same as the last one because the next step is going to be with your white pencil. Your white pencil or he recommends a white crayon. So we're going to let this watercolor dry right now. And I have two pencils. This is the Pit Pastel by Faber Castell. This is one I got for the Wild Wonder Conference because Steda uh, used it for her uh, for her class. I think it was her class where she used gouache on toned paper, um, and it seemed like a really good white pencil. Um, and then this is just a Faber Castell Polychromos um, white pencil. Jack is recommending in the book using a um, crayon. So I'm going to read the next step. Um, once the, once the shadows of the foam are dry, rub the edges of the foam area with a white crayon to create a waxy mask that will prevent other paint from staying on the paper. Dance the crayon back and forth to create a rough edge that will suggest foam. Experiment with this technique on a separate piece of paper to explore the results. So before hitting the record button, I did experiment with this a little bit to see which of my 
tools would actually um, resist. So you can see here the pit pencil. Um, when I painted directly over it with this green wash, you can see where it has resisted. Um, up here, I drew with the um, the other one, the polychromos, and it didn't seem like it resisted that well. So I'm going to stick to this one. So what he's, he's saying is to kind of draw in where you see the foam um, here and um, with your white pencil. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I've sort of cheated a little bit by drawing around where I want my foam already with that purple. So let's go ahead and um, he says dance the crayon um, so that you get some randomness. And then I'm actually going to use the other one on here so I have sort of an experiment going on. If you want, what you could do is um, on a separate part of your paper, you could make a bunch of lines with this, whichever pencil or um, crayon you're experimenting with. Um, and then that way you can try watercolor over it. I'm going to write down the name. Um, so this is Pit. Reminds me of Kate Rudder's Avocado Pit. Um, and then I'm going to, on this one, I'm going to do similar lines up here. I can't even see where these ones are. Um, and write down PC for poly, I'll write poly chrome. So one thing I like to do is whenever you start off a page like this with a lot of little experiments, it makes it a lot less scary. If we just had a blank page and we were looking at this illustration of Jack's and imagining doing that on here, that's there's something a lot more intimidating about that. So however, having like, I can see, oh, I have options. I have little, you know, scratches on here, little notes, little swatches, all of that takes the pressure off of the, the single drawing. So um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and test some of these with a watercolor wash. So what he is recommending is, I'm gonna zoom out so you can see more of the whole page again. Um, what he is recommending is uh, doing a graded wash. So this is sort of an advanced um, intermediate, I should say, watercolor technique. Um, we're going to be going from, we're gonna be, it's, we're gonna be doing a little bit of wet on wet and while things are still wet, we're going to be darkening this area, but we're also going to be doing a graded wash, which means we're trying to go from blue to green um, gradually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some of those colors ready and test them on the white pencil that I put up here at the top. Okay, so I'm going to mix um, mainly a serpentine genuine for my green. And I'm gonna get this all ready in this mixing area. Then I'm gonna get a blue ready over here. And I'm probably gonna use ultramarine. And actually I'll test a little bit of that green just by itself. So this would be the top of the wave where the light is coming through. And it looks like when I paint right over the pencil, at least that heavy of, of watercolor wash, it doesn't resist very well. Maybe when I paint a lighter one. So it's looking to me like it's not resisting very strongly. Um, so I'm gonna be careful and not assume that it's just going to um, completely prevent uh, prevent the um, watercolor from going in there. And if you look at his, you can kind of see these sort of like rush rough edges. And I don't think that this masking technique is necessary to achieve the results, um, you know, to pick uh, a wave like this. It's sort of just a nice technique to, to experiment and try. Okay, so now I'm gonna get my blue ready. Um, so I recommend doing this in sort of two, having two separate washes for the, um, when you do a graded wash. So I've got my blue over here. 
and actually ended up doing mostly in Danthrone blue, which is the really dark blue. And I'm gonna test that over the white. It's doing basically the same thing, so. And that's what the Indan Throne looks like over Serpentine Genuine. Just to be scientific, I'm going to put notes about what colors I'm using. So I recommend having abbreviations for all the colors in your watercolor palette. So I have SG and I have um, IB. Um, and then this is the two over each other, IB. Okay, so next what I'm gonna do is I am gonna go ahead and try to imitate his graded wash here. So um, starting with a pale um, green and then coming in with blue from down below. So I'm gonna start with the green first, get my brush completely clean. One thing you could do if you want is to have two separate brushes, one for each color when you do this. Um, there's several ways to do this, but I'm gonna do I'm just gonna start going down from the top. Um, and I'm gonna sort of paint around my foam mostly and not assume that the the um, pencil, the white pencil will be able to do all that work. So as I get to this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and clean my brush off a little bit, remove some of that color. And then I'm gonna keep coming down. I'm gonna remove a little more color. Keep coming, oops, that was a little bit too much water. So you can see how it's still wet down here, but I have, that is basically just a graded wash from green to lighter green. Now I'm gonna come in and get my blue and I'm gonna come up the other way. So I'm gonna see how, how dark that contrast is there. I don't want it to be, I want it to be more graded. So I'm gonna clean my, brush off a little bit and then continue. Okay, it's not the most perfect graded wash, but that's why we have multiples. It, it, that's a graded wash, that counts as a graded wash. Okay, so now I'm gonna do another one. So hopefully you're also doing this where you have multiple things. This, this is a really good way if you're ever feeling like a technique is challenging to you Doing, having multiple going at the same time is a really, at least for my mindset, this is a really good way for me to not like freak out and think that I'm messing everything up. So I'm gonna go over here to this one and I'm gonna do it again. And even if I, even if I don't experiment with like, you know, one technique, a uh, second technique, I know I already did a different pencil on here, but even just having multiple versions that I'm working on takes a lot of pressure off. Um, actually, so maybe I'll try, I will try something different. I'm going to start this time with the blue and come up from below. And I'm going to start with it, start darker with the blue. So like I said, this is, since this is a smaller area, you might have to clean the brush, um, cause it won't by itself lose enough color to start getting, um, lighter. So I'm wiping the brush off on a separate page that you can't see always and going up to the top. Okay, so I started with the blue on this one. And now I'm going to come in with the and that's a granulating color right there. Look at that serpentine genuine. I know my lights not great. I need to work on that. But look at how there's that variation. This is from one pigment in my palette, the serpentine genuine and to see that that's that's the indication of a granulating pigment. Whereas this indanthrone blue um, doesn't look like it has that going on. Oops, I shouldn't be talking because I'm doing a, I'm trying to do this while it's still wet. Oops, that's kind of dark green. So I'm going to clean my brush off and bring this down because we want it to look like there's light coming through. Light coming through the wave is what makes the top of the wave look more green. Um, it's also angled away from the sky, whereas down here, it's facing up towards the sky more. So it has more, that's the main reason why this part of the wave is more blue and that part of the wave is more green. Okay, cool. I'd say they look pretty different. Okay, let's see what he says now. Um, he says, we already did this, paint the face of the wave with a graded wash that blends from light green to blue. While the paint is still wet, darken the base of the wave. Whoops. 
we were supposed to darken this while the paint is still wet. So that one is not wet anymore, but this one is. So I can do that one while it's still wet. So I'm going to use my Indanthron blue is a, a relatively dark blue. So I'm going to see if I can do it just with that. I have a feeling that's what he used because he likes Indanthron blue. But maybe he had to use something else because his doesn't look so saturated of a blue. So I'm going to soften the edges a little bit. I cleaned my brush and I'm going to soften the edge a little bit before I put anything darker into the middle. But I am going to put something darker into the middle. Um, and what he's talking about is he's saying that the darker you make this part of the wave, the more it will seem like there's notice how in his painting, it looks like it's glowing. Um, it looks like it's glowing. And so he says that that is achieved by making this part darker. So in art, we have to, everything is relative. So this can look like it has light coming through it. If you make the other areas very, very dark. So I think what I'm actually going to use is I might go straight to my neutral tint, which is, the closest thing to black I have in my palette. Um, and I'm going to drop some of this into here while this is still wet. Hopefully that won't be too crazy. And we are going to paint white gouache over this for the foam. I'm going to clean my brush a little bit off to the side and then try to soften this edge here. My paper is starting to reach, uh, if I keep rubbing too much, my paper is going to start reaching the limits of what it can handle in terms of like scrubbing. Um, this paper is 150 GSM and it is like a, uh, it's not a smooth surface. I think it's like a medium surface, but um, my this paper can't handle like really serious scrubbing. So if you notice like a weird texture starting to develop on your paper, that's the sign that you need to kind of stop um, scrubbing it, stop working on it and let it dry. So I'm going to make a note um, that I added dark while wet. Um, the way he recommends. And then um, on this one, I'm going to say added dark um, afterwards. Uh, yes, Eve, that is, that is a really good. Um, I think that that's how I often do graded washes is turning the page upside down if I'm, you know, working at home in the studio. Um, but while filming, it's kind of harder, like with the stuff that I have um, set up around me and all that. Okay, my pencil thing resist is not really working the way that it's supposed to. I have a feeling the crayon is better for resisting. If anyone is using a white crayon, please let me know in the comments how it's working um, as a resist. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to this one real quick. I'm trying not to make having multiple drawings um, add that much more to how how long things take me to do. Um, that's not what I'm that's not what I'm going for. So I want to be relatively fast with it. Clean the brush. I almost feel like that didn't need to be wet to do. That seems like that came out pretty good without being wet on wet. It's not as dark. Okay. Because I didn't do the neutral tint. So neutral tint. Okay, he's now saying um, the darker the base of the wave, the more brightly the green will glow. Similarly, darken the ocean behind the wave. The flatter water in front of the wave reflects more of the sky and consequently will be bluer than the curling wave provided the sky is blue. Okay, so what we're going to do is 
I want you to notice that on his, you can see, um, I'm getting funny. Um, my, my pencils are pretty waxy, but apparently they're not as waxy as the um, crayon. Okay, so notice how you can see the, um, the, the, the ocean. You can see a little bit of the top of the wave, um, the crest, and then you can see the blue behind it, and then you can see the sky. So try to get all three of those things in in your drawing. I might only get two, I'm noticing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw lines to sort of um, delineate where those are. Um, and then here is going to be the sky. I mean, the... Um, ocean behind it so right now I'm gonna go in and make that ocean a dark a relatively dark blue and look how dark he made the sky all of that makes the the wave pop more there I'm hitting some resist I hit some resist there okay it, it, it's working but it's just working uh, inconsistently for me. Oh, Payne's gray. That's a really good, um, good idea. Ivea. I have a funny mental image of Eli throwing stuff out of the closet, looking for a pencil. Thanks for that. Um, mental image. I know Eli does supposedly have lots of art supplies. So, um, okay, now I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to do the, I uh, maybe it's dry enough. I'm going to do the sky and he made the sky really dark. So I'm going to use Payne's gray. Hardly ever use Payne's gray. It's the one right next to neutral tint. I'm going to copy Ivea because copying is okay in the nature journaling community. It's an open source community and I'm going to do the sky back here. It looks like he did the sky even, and look at how he's so sneaky. He, he left this little white line. He doesn't say anything about it in the description, but there's this little bit of a white line at the horizon. There's little things like that, that sort of happen by sort of the more you do watercolor or drawing of any sort, you start doing little things almost like automatically or by accident, but they're actually helping your drawing or your painting. And so notice how he's got this, sometimes having this little white edge is bad between two colors, but I think in this case, it actually creates a, a cool effect. Ooh, birthday candles. Okay, so in case you don't have any crayons, but you happen to have birthday candles, you can do that. Whoa, Karen used a Dermatograph Diamond China Marker. Fancy. Dermatograph sounds like something you would do on your skin. All right, I think it's almost time for a chocolate break. Wax paper. Someone did a wax paper trick. Okay, so I'm letting this dry, but I actually kind of like the way this is looking so far. I like this. Um... Jack probably has birthday candles lying around the house because he has kids, but I don't know about the rest of you out there um, who maybe don't have uh, young kids around the house. You maybe like me do not have birthday candles just lying around, but maybe I'm speaking for myself. Maple ice cream, that sounds like something I had while I was in Vermont. Okay, so the next step, I'm feeling pretty good about this. The next step is paint surface foam with permanent white gouache once the wave is completely dry. The lines made by foam will be more vertical when you look straight out into the surf, but diagonal when you look up or down the beach. At the base of the wave, the foam forms closely spaced horizontal drifts, so any blue water that shows through will make narrow horizontal lines. So let's do a little um, let's do a little practice there. Uh, bye, Debbie. 
I totally uh, feel you on inconsistent internet. I know how that can be. Let's do a little practice down here on perspective stuff. So what he's saying is that um, if there's a wave coming towards you, the middle of it is going to have lines going straight up like that. And the further sort of down the beach you look, the more angled like that it's going to be. So practice drawing something like that. And then maybe making it into a wave if you want. And then, so this is a wave coming towards you. If you're standing on the beach looking straight out at the ocean, this would be a wave coming towards you. Then maybe the one in front of this is actually curling over and breaking. In which case, these lines are going to be coming in this way, where it's curling over. And then here, they're kind of going slightly. I don't know if this matches jack's thing because these are kind of curling up that way so those are waves coming towards you and then in the front what he's saying is that the lines get closer so let's for our example that would look like they're kind of these foam lines going like this down the wave and down here, like in front of the wave, they're gonna be really close together and further up the wave, these foam lines would be further apart. And this is really similar to his thing about trees. So right here in the section about trees, he talks about how, see how these lines get closer together near the edges of the tree and in the middle of the tree, they get further apart. So when you draw the tree, if you can exaggerate that, um, it makes the tree look round. It's the same. It's the same with the wave. So he's he knows that that is the pattern. So when he draws this, because a lot of this wave he's drawing from memory, he makes these parts of the ocean really narrow between the parts of the foam, whereas up here the parts of the water between the parts of the foam are bigger. Does that make sense? Yes, Ivea, but those are black magic um, candles. I cannot use them in my nature journal. Speaking of black magic, I think it's time for my chocolate. Um, also for warding off the demonic forces. Chocolate is very helpful. This one was at grocery outlet and sometimes one game that I like to play is to figure out why something is at grocery outlet and like 90% cheaper than it usually would be. And so this is a really good chocolate company. However, this 85% with piece of raspberry in it tastes a little bit weird to me. Um, I feel like the combinations not maybe the raspberry would actually go better with a less dark chocolate. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that, but something about the sourness of the raspberry with a really dark chocolate, it's almost like it doesn't match. Maybe if the raspberries were more sweet or if they just had the, if it were just 85% chocolate. Anyways, that's what I got. I got like 10 bars of it because it was on the super huge sale at grocery outlet. And, and now I realize why it was on a huge sale. Anyways, that's what I have. So that's what I'm going to eat. And I think this is dry enough. Just in case, I will use my blow dryer. But I'm going to pause my audio so you don't get the sound of my blow dryer. All right, that's probably enough of that. The cool thing about being a watercolorist is it gives you a good excuse to have a um, a, blow, uh, a hair dryer um, in case you actually need an excuse.
to have one. But okay, so I think we're ready. I'm getting carried away with the funny stuff. So I think what we're ready to do is actually do this permanent white gouache. So my gouache, my white gouache often looks like that because I have been using it to create other colors. So my three favorite, you can tell what my three favorite colors to create with my white gouache are. Um, there is a pink. A lot of times pink cannot be created that great just with the uh, quinacridone pink straight out of the um, you know watercolor over here. So adding white to it, that's one of the colors that I use my white gouache for. I also use my white gouache for creating sort of like this lilac color. Oh, look how pretty, look how pretty that color is right there. Um, so I use it for that color. Oh, I love that color. Um, and then I also use it for sort of like a teal or a turquoise. So um, this teal or turquoise color, um, some of our lichens match that color. Sometimes water matches that color and I use white gouache for that. So what that means is the pure white is basically hidden underneath here. So I'm gonna clean, clean it up a little bit before doing the next part. Um, if you are using a palette like mine, this is the John Muir Laws palette has permanent white gouache over here. Um, otherwise use whatever gouache that you have, but try to get it as clean and as white as possible. And let's read, let's read what he says here. Paint surface foam with permanent white gouache once the wave is completely dry, the lines by the, made by the foam will be more vertical when you look straight out into the surf. Wait, I read this already. Okay, so basically get it as strong as you can. You can see here that he has variations in how heavy it is. Um, so try to get it as, um, as, as thick of a white as you can. So don't really add too much water. So if you're using an aquash water brush, don't squeeze it too much. Um, and get as thick of a, a, a white as you can. And remember, opposite this with gouache, it's the opposite of watercolor. Wait, how does this work? So when you put it down, it looks lighter than it really is. And as it dries, uh, as it dries, it gets less opaque. So it'll seem stronger and whiter as it's wet. I think that's how it goes. And then as it gets dry, it'll look less so. So let's go in here and get these lines. Um, so remember, we've got these curving lines. If you want, trace them out somewhere else. Try to get these curving lines. If this wave is breaking this way, there's going to be curving lines going that way. Um, that's the opposite of the way I showed it here because I think it's the perspective on that he's looking from. That's weird. I'm going to have to go out and uh, look at some actual waves and compare this. I feel like that those curves are a little bit confusing okay so let's go in here and start putting down some of these remember whenever you're using like a white tool like this you can get carried away you don't want to get carried away um i mean you can but just be aware of what the consequences might be whoa that's way too netted um and then remember down here, they're getting closer together. I'm going to get some new, new gouache. It looks like it has way more color in it than I want, like more green. And it might be just picking that up from underneath. I really don't like the way this strong one is going that way. That's way too strong going that way. So I'm going to put in a stronger one to kind of, oh gosh, maybe that was even worse. I'm so glad I have two of these, two to mess up instead of just one to mess up. Okay, I, I don't know, that kind of ruined it, I think. I might need to eat some more chocolate just to, uh, that one is definitely too thick. Okay, so on my next one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make these way less thick and I'm just gonna start with really simple ones and really kind of following this, just the simple curve here.
So this is one of those things I think where n this is a challenging subject. So I think going into this knowing that this is challenging is helpful because if your thing doesn't come out looking right, then you know that it's, you can't just blame yourself. And I know some of us just want to blame ourselves. Um, that's fine. Um, but uh, you can't in this case. You can't take res full responsibility for this because this is a challenging subject. Um, so my lines are not coming out the way that I would like. Um, but I think it's okay. I think one, just to sort of psychoanalyze my own, uh, <laughs> approach this line, I got way too carried away with that one. I think having a thinner foam line there would be better. Um, this one I think is, these ones are kind of okay. I'm glad that I had to, um, take some time to like reflect on your own and make any notes about it. This is also a chance for venting. So like, for example, if you get caught up in not liking how that came out or feeling sad about it, you can just say, um, what happened? question mark, exclamation mark, um, too thick. I'm going to draw a sad face. Drawing sad faces always makes me feel better. Um, so get, get that part out. Um, Eva is saying something about the skin guy um usually the horizon is lighter than the zenith right so the darker part of the gradient would be higher up yes usually that is true i don't have enough of the sky to really capture that but i think what Ivea is saying is that um like say if i did it over here if this were if this were the sky and if this were the sky and this were the horizon and this is like the ocean down here, then um, my sky would would be um, start off darker at the top and then get lighter as it comes down. And this is a really good thing to just at least verbalize because the crazy thing is, is that people look at this kind of stuff every single day of their life, but most people don't... Um, most people don't actually like think about how like like if you just ask a random person is the sky darker straight above you or darker close to the horizon they won't know the answer um, without having to look at it and so that's like kind of crazy and that's one of the cool things about um drawing is that you have to kind of pay attention to those and coming up with those rules or, or trying to develop rules, even if they later you have to adapt them or they turn out they're wrong, it, it forces you to look at things more carefully. So um, thank you, Ivea, for, for bringing up that topic. I'm gonna go ahead and do the, the ocean. The ocean should always be like significantly darker than the sky, like way more dark than that even. And there are always, um, there can often be exceptions to some of these rules. So, and there's times where um, exaggerating them can be helpful. So like, if you look here in Jack's, look how dark he made the sky. And I think that doing that helped make this um, stand out more. Okay, so I wanna make my white gouache wider. So you can, once the gouache, it's really important to let it dry completely before you put any more down. I think mine might've been sort of polluted by all of these all this turquoise I've been making here. So I'm gonna come back in and do a little bit more on top. And you can see on his that he did it in multiple layers and they're not all equally strong. So like that foam right there is stronger than that foam there. This kind of looks like, these are two separate. I'm noticing now these are not the same. This looks like a separate painting to me. This resist here looks totally different in this one than it does in that one. Are you noticing that? This is a separate painting from that one. Okay, okay, I, I guess these two are the same and these two are the same, maybe. Okay, so I'm gonna do white on top. Sometimes it's hard to get the gouache to be completely white and I think I'm noticing that again now. 
And if you were here when we did the iris, then you know I talked about the other opaque tools that you can use. A lot of times when I paint the ocean, I just use my jumbo correction pin. So I go straight to, to that. Um, that would have been a fun thing to test out um, on the side. Oh, Eli, that is a really good, really, really cool. I'm going to have to share that on the screen here because that is a really good idea. So does this count? Does that include people as well? And how do other people feel about that if they see you looking at them and thinking? And, and they realize that you're looking at them and thinking like, how would I paint them? That is a question. So this would be, I'm going to, I'm going to do an experiment here um, where I just use this. Um, uh, I'm going to write white gouache and then I'm going to experiment with this other one. And then this is jumbo. I'm not going to write jumbo correction pin because presto jumbo correction pin is a really long name. And if I write jumbo, what else would it be? Oh, I should do this. I should follow my own advice and always do this on a separate piece of paper to kind of get it flowing, get that thing flowing. I kind of wish I had just used the jumbo correction pin instead of the gouache, but I'm glad that I followed the directions. And I think next time I'm going to see, I did get a little bit of a good resist in like one spot. So let me show you. Um, I don't know if you can see, but like right there, there's resist from the, the pencil. But for the most part, um, I had to rely on the opaque gouache to create the white lines. I kind of like, the way the jumbo correction, um, the jumbo correction pin is just like pure white, um, whereas this is sort of like diluted white. But um, so we've completed the exercise, and let me know in the comments how you fared. I it, I think it was a worthwhile exercise. I want to go out and try applying these um, at the actual coast, and um, let me know which one you want to do, which page, just so, oh, that's the other thing. Let's write down, um, it, it's always good to write down like page 288 um, JML book so that you know where you're referencing this from. It's sort of like metadata for a study page. So um, thanks everybody for joining in. Let me know which exercise from Jack's book you want to do next time and this Sunday is going to be really cool. I'm going to be interviewing this Canadian reptile keeper and he's going to bring some of his animals. We're going to get to draw his animals and then I'm going to ask him some questions about nature journaling pets and things like that. So thank you all for joining in. Um, thank you, Ivea, Eli, Karen, Kate, uh, Marilyn, and anyone else who is still here, I know Debbie, I think, had to go, but it looks like there's 20 other people watching. Thank you all for joining in. That was really fun. Practice from John Muir Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. Um, this is basically, if you didn't know it already, ooh, Wendy's here also. Thanks for joining in, Wendy. If you didn't know it already, the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling is basically the Bible of nature journaling. Um, so... Practicing these is so good because there's so many pages in here that I've never done before. Like, look at how cool this one is. Maybe we should do this one next. This totally looks like California right where I live. Oh yeah, Angie's here too. Thanks for joining in, Angie. So glad you're back. Um, tune in on Sunday if you want to draw some reptiles. All right, good night, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Re go reward yourself now. You did some nature journaling. You exercise some discipline, go eat some chocolate, pour yourself a glass of wine or whatever. All right. Bye. Bye, Marilyn. Bye, TF. Good night, everybody.